Right. So thanks very much for the uh, introduction and uh, to, uh, thanks to EMEA for organizing this meeting, which I think is quite timely. Um, so this is the first slide. And basically, most of you will agree with this. Uh, there'll be some disagreement, and there's never a unanimity of opinion in MS anyway. Um, so long-term outcomes, to LTOs, account for the main social, medical, and economic impact of MS, and they exponentially increase in time very roughly. So that MS is a very end-loaded disease. The costs, the, the, the grief are down towards the end as opposed to at the beginning. Now, the main determinant of long-term outcome is whether or not you get secondary progressive disease. And that's what leads, for the vast majority of people, to requiring a cane, being bedridden, or dead, EDSS 6, 8, and 10. So the development of SP is what matters most to patients, families, third-party payers. And what happens once you get it is relatively predictable, and it's irreversible. Now, so far, all SP treatment studies have been negative, and there's been very little focus on development of secondary progression as an outcome in, in trials. There are many drugs that reduce relapses, many drugs that reduce MRI. None convincingly influence long-term outcomes. None of them lengthen time to secondary progression, and none of them alter secondary progressive probability, at least it's been demonstrated. Relapses aren't suitable outcomes if long-term outcome is the target. And we know that short-term disability measures basically are uh, influenced heavily by relapses as opposed to what patients generally consider as disability. So natural history data on early relapses are, uh, we'll go over in a moment, but uh, we'll discuss how the relapses might play, potentially play a role. Now, this quotation uh, I think is apt and applies to the situation. Robert McNamara, the Foreign Secretary of Defense in the United States, said it's important to measure what matters most, not make what can most easily be measured matter. And I think this is very apropos of MS clinical trials, as this epitomizes much of the last 25 years. So let's go back 25 years. And this is the Jekyll Island referendum in 1989, where 60 MS trialists, almost all the major trialists in the world, were at the same place. And they were polled and asked what was the important, most important measure of response to therapy. And the first two at the top were pretty much the same, change in EDSS, more than equal to or greater than one, on two consecutive exams, unspecified as to the interval. Now, if you look at the bottom, that's where relapse frequency was. Relapse frequency in 1989 was believed to be the least important outcome measure that was listed in all the various outcomes that were, 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 were proposed. Now, in the interim, there's been nothing that has actually validated relapses. And we'll go on a little further and talk about natural history in this context. So I spent many years seeing 20 or 30 MS patients a week for about 25 years with the help of a lot of colleagues to put together this natural history study, a group of patients, more than 1,000, who weren't treated, essentially, other than for steroids. 806 relapsed remaining patients. It was a population-based sample. There was essentially full ascertainment for a core subgroup. And the population was very stable, which allowed us to do this study. Very little out-migration other than myself. So when we reanalyzed the data, 28,000 patient years, the shortest follow-up in the sample being 16 years, we were able to say that this was the only natural history study giving an accounting of loss and retention. So natural history studies has to be viewed just like clinical trials. You want to know who's in and who's out and why. But we were able pretty much to find everybody uh, with a few percentage missing, and we were pretty confident of the results. So 95% follow-up, 97% diagnostic accuracy. This is mostly pre-MRI. More than 40% of the patients were dead. More than 40% were EDSS 6 plus. So we observed more than 75% of the lifetime history of MS, and certainly more than 90% of the ambulatory course. And our focus was on what happened prior to secondary progression, for reasons you'll see in a moment. Now, just to reiterate how important the development of secondary progression is, the, these survival curves, which show you the, uh, from disease onset, the time to DSS-6 and DSS-8 on the right, so DSS-8 almost bedridden status. And what you can see here is that the latency of onset of SP, secondary progression, is a huge determinant of long-term outcome, in this case, bedridden status. So the various curves, are essentially there for the latency. And if the you see RR1 equals five years, that means the latency of the SP was one to five years. And at the top, 
r are equal to or greater than 13 years, that means the latency to SP was, was equal to or greater than 13 years. So the difference in those curves is enormous, and it shows you the dominant, overwhelming effect of developing secondary progression. Now let's take a look at relapses, and let's look at DSS 8 and 10, which is cane, bed, and dead, and we're not going to use the kind of outcomes that have been used in relapse domain trials because they're fragile. So let's take a look at the site of the first attack. Does that have anything to do with long-term outcome? And the answer is no. No significant difference among the common sites of initial attack. And is there preferential progression at the site of in initial attacks? And the answer is no. What about recovery for first attack? No recovery, partial recovery, complete recovery. Does that influence long-term outcome 6, 8, and 10? And the answer is not at all. So lack of recovery is not an intrinsic feature of individual disease. It seems to be determined by random factors, and this is evident to any experienced clinician who's followed patients for any length of time. So what about whether or not the onset is polysymptomatic or disseminated versus unifocal? And the answer is there's no impact. So severe onset versus mild onset, the time to 6, 8, and 10 is the same. Let's take a look at primary progressive disease. 28% of those will have relapses at some point. Do the ones who have relapses do any different than the ones who don't? And the answer is there's no difference. With relapses, without relapses, the times for 6, 8, and 10 are the same. And this is a survival curve illustrating that. So let's look at the age of onset of progressive course. So this is important. Because progressive course, or SP, is the dominant influence on outcome, then you would predict if relapses had some impact on the long-term course, that there would be a difference in the age of onset of the progressive course when you compare those with frequent relapses to those who had none or one. And you're going to see on the next slide the age of onset of SP in those groups. And you can see for SPMS, SPMS minus the single attack progressive cases, the single attack progressive cases, which we studied specifically because they allow you to associate progression from the confounding effect of relapses often present in ordinary SPMS, and then PPMS, and you can see that the age of onset of progression is the same within a year of the mean. There's no difference. So clearly, these people with SPMS at the top that had lots of relapses actually started their secondary progressive course a year later than the PPMS patients who had not had any preceding relapses. So there's no indication relapses influence the age of onset of SP. Now, a lot of people believe this... Oh, this has been scrambled slightly, but anyway, uh, widely believe that causality uh, is associated, or is, it, it, it pertains to, to relapses and late disability. But if this were true, then there would be a number of predictions that you could make, and the first one we've already dealt with, relapse frequency would increase the age of onset of SP, and it doesn't. You would say that the total number of attacks would relate to worse outcome. It doesn't. We'll come back to that. And you would say that attacks during pivotal trials might be more important, and they're not, and we'll show you why in a minute. In a minute. So this is now looking at the, uh, the effect of latency to progression on the SP course itself. So if you have a short latency or a long latency to developing SP, is it different in terms of the survival curve for the SP course itself? And the answer is no, which is a bit co contrary to expectation. So the course itself of SP is the same irrespective of how long it took you to get there from the onset of the disease. So let's go back. Let's compare survival in primary progressive MS, single attack progressive MS, and secondary progressive MS, once again, looking at hard outcomes, 6, 8, and 10. And what you see here is, at the bottom is the legend, so red is PPMS, white is SPMS, and green is single attack progressive MS. And the survival curves are essentially the same. So in fact, this kind of details what we'd already suspected from the two slides ago, that the mean age of onset of SP is the same in the various groups. So let's look at progression and the total number of relapses. And we've broken this down into year one, year two, versus year three to SP. The reason for that is because the statistician noted there was a natural division in the data. It wasn't any hypothesis, I have to say. So now we're looking at the total number of relapses during a relapse remaining phase. This is time to EDSS6. The time to eight is the same, by the way. And you have on the top there one to two relapses. Time to six is 15 years, but at the bottom, equal to or greater than five relapses during the relapse remaining phase, it's 15.6 years. So in fact, there's no effect, it's demonstrable in natural history data, of early of relapses during the, during the relapse remaining phase that, that is considered in total. Those are hazard ratios. 
Now, if we look at, we said there was a natural divide between at year two. If we look at relapses from year three on to onset of SP, which is, remember, these are the relapses enumerated in most clinical trials leading to drug approval. In fact, relapses is actually, are associated with a better outcome, not a worse outcome. So you actually are better off, at least if you, if you, if you think there's a causal relationship in terms of uh, the, having more frequent relapses. So there's no rationale that I can see for suppressing relapses if your focus is on long-term outcome. Yes, relapses are inconvenient and they can, can cause some disability, but I think that has to be made clear to, to everybody. Now, in the first two years, there is an association with early relapses. And this is now looking at time to DSS-6 or time to SP. And what you see is if you had three or more relapses in the first two years, you got to six sooner and several years sooner than if you only had one. And so there is an effect here of the early one to two years of relapses having an association with long-term outcome. And I say association pointedly because this is not a causal relationship. So you could argue early relapses are associated by a number of potential ways. The first is that relapses lead to success of cumulative unremitting disability at relapse time. But it does to a degree. So one-fifth get to the DSS-3 via relapse and stay there. But there's no impact. No impact on 6, 8, or 10 for total relapse frequency. Increased probability of progression? Hardly. <coughs> Short and late CDSP? There's a big effect. So the effect of the frequent relapses in year one or two exert almost, almost all their effect via shortening the latency of SP, not through the accumulation of successive relapses. And is the slope of worsening any different? And the answer is not hardly at all. Now let's go on to suppressing relapses and progression and long-term follow-up data and <coughs> suppression of MRI and progression. And we, we, we're indebted to um, the long-term follow-up study that uh, was carried out by a number of investigators with the help of, of, of uh, buyer shearing on the original interferon population. Now this is now looking at the univariate regressions of relationship between two-year outcome in the trial and the 16-year outcome for physical and cognitive abilities. And what you'll see is for physical outcome, which is the second column, that there are really <coughs> no major uh, influences uh, in terms of prediction with the exception of baseline EDSS, which is easy to measure and costs almost nothing. Baseline EDSS, even R square of 0.22, the other ones are all quite small. And if you look at, uh, whoops, let's go on to the on-study variables. And for the on-study variables, which are the ones of course we're assessing at this meeting, you can see, starting from the bottom, that change in MRI, which is what turned the key for the FDA back in, in 1992, uh, actually has zero predictive value for physical disability at 16 years. Zero. If we go up to the number of new T2 lesions, it's 0 0.1. So as 1% of the variance is attributable to the number of T2 lesions. If we go up to confirmed one-point EDSS progression trial outcomes, once again, people are happy with what confirmed one-point EDSS progression, but it accounts for 2% of the variance. So it's largely nothing to do with that measure. And if we go up, we finally run into some things which are significant. And we see that the EDSS change from baseline uh, is uh, 0.11. Interestingly, the annual relapse rate during the course of the trial, which are treatment resistant relapses, uh, is, uh, is significant, but still modest uh, explanation of variance is only 12%. And for the cognitive outcomes, you'll see there's virtually nothing. They're almost all zero. So what to do? Well. The first thing is stop marketers from misleading patients and families that relapsing and drugs prevent disability. They don't. For trials to be ethical, outcomes must be validated and primary data has got to be with the investigators and there have been a, a, a very long sort of history of, of uh, overlooking this request both from regulatory agencies and also from journals and medical associations. So many investigators are happy to put their name on papers that they've not seen the data. And that's evident from the Hinchliffe Committee, which was reporting to the Parliament here in the UK when a number of these were uncovered. We should be aiming for long-term outcomes, and the most successful is SP or second SP development. And I'm confident you could do a trial in less than five years. I know that's a long time. I know it's going to be difficult, and I'm sure everybody will jump up and say that. Any lesser outcome should require obligatory long-term follow-up and a drug license be pulled for non-compliance. I know that's harsh, but uh, I think that's what needs to be done. 
All this was suggested to Paul Lieber at the FDA in 1993. The FDA asked Berling Sherex, uh, 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 Berlex uh, Sherring at that time, to actually do the long-term follow-up, but they didn't enforce it. So in fact, no long-term follow-up was done. But by the time uh, Volker and Appertz and I got together and tried to do this, it proved to be difficult. But certainly, in, in the end, uh, largely through his efforts, it was possible to do it. So. Uh, a lot of contributors to what I've said, especially colleagues in London, Ontario, the Naturalist Studies, Recent Relapse Analysis, and Antonio Scalfari. The LTF studies I've mentioned. Uh, Martin Dahmer has had an enormous role in all of this, as the director of the Sylvie Laurie Center, and as we published a number of papers together looking at the evaluation of disability outcomes. So that's the end. And that's a quote from Morris Sendak. Thank you. <laughs>